Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Monday LinkedIn Live. Actually, the last Monday LinkedIn Live, uh, but we'll 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 talk about that at the end. Um, it's a huge, huge, huge pleasure to have as my last guest, uh, my dear friend Sarah. And Sarah, um, you've been on this show before. Um, so I'm sure some of my audience probably remembers our last interview, but for those of them who don't, uh, I would absolutely love if you could just introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, sure. Th thanks for having me, Miha. And again, I'm so, I'm honored, I'm sad, I'm humbled to, to be your final guest on this three and a half year journey you've been. Hi, everyone out there. My name is Sarah Noel Wilson. I own a leadership coaching and consulting practice where my colleagues and I are very much on a mission to help the workplace work better for humans. One of the ways that we do that is in helping people have the conversations that they've been avoiding with themselves and others and recently wrote a book on this very topic of how do we don't feed the elephant in the room? How do we don't feed the elephants and start overcoming our art of avoidance, as I lovingly call, call it, to have powerful partnerships? I also, you know, I also play the accordion. I have a dog that <laughs> snuggles with me and brings me joy on days when things are hard and super excited to be here with you all. Perfect. Well, you know, let, let's, let's go from that elephant. So uh, what's the message behind it? Yeah. Um, let, let, let's start with, you know, introducing the topic and then we can, you know, up it up a little bit. Sure. Yeah. It's I, I became really intrigued and interested with the idea of the elephant in the room when I first was introduced to it uh, over 10 years ago, um, because we know that cultures and teams that work really well are ones where people can have honest conversations, where we can disagree, where we can, you know, if, if we, if we can free the, I mean, hopefully we can prevent the elephant, but at minimum, you know, we can get it out of the room. And for those who are listening, the, you know, the idea of the elephant in the room, it's, um, it started as a very Western metaphor of we're talking about things that are, we're not talking about things rather that are important. And a lot of times when people think of the idea of the elephant in the room, you know, they often will talk about it as if it's a person or a thing. When in, in reality, what we found is that the elephant gets created because we're avoiding acknowledging or addressing a harmful behavior that's getting in the way or a harmful be barrier that's getting in the way of our success. And that could be addressing it with ourselves or addressing it with someone else. And, and, and I realized I had never worked on a team where the culture was that, you know, the elephant could be called out or freed. And I didn't have a lot of relationships where that was the case. And that's largely because I, I, I grew up and I had very skillfully developed my avoidance of any kind of conflict or confrontation skills. So I, you know, <laughs> this yeah. research and work over the last 10 years has, has been to help me overcome that as well. I mean, I see that so often with leaders all over the place from small companies to big corporations. Um, there's this little fly, but then they put it under the rug. Mm. And then this fly becomes an elephant and mm. then a family, a whole family of <laughs> elephants. Um, and people really, really love to avoid those conversations. And that's just really no solution because sooner or later, everything just blows up anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So. I mean, what I, well, what, yeah, I, no, so, what I was going to say to that is one of the things that I've learned is that the comfort we gain in the short term almost never outweighs the damage that happens in the long term, right? And there are times, there are times when we won't be able to have a conversation because maybe it's not safe. Um, maybe we're, we just decide that it's not the battle I want to pick today. Um, you know, there might be a whole host of reasons, but like you said, it's, it doesn't go away. It's just going to keep being there. It's going to keep being a problem. And I just had somebody the other day tell me who was in the process of reading the book. She said, I didn't think I had a lot of elephants in my life because I'm a pretty straight shooter. I, you know, she said, but then I realized I've just gotten so used to them existing and I've tolerated them for so long that I didn't even realize they were there anymore because I just co cohabitated with them um, for so long. That's, that's also true. Yeah. But yeah, we know that the solution is not to put them under the rug. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we start from the beginning, so something yeah. happens in a team, in a company, or even in your personal life, a little fly comes mm. into the picture. Um, 
what would be you know your suggestion or maybe like you know uh, a few steps of how to deal with that how to approach it how to have those difficult conversations how to just open the space up mm-hmm. so that people can feel safe to communicate about these things and then address it and 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 grow from it the whole team can really grow from it yeah I, I'm first and foremost, we just have to be aware that we're avoiding in the first place. That's that's something that we spend quite a bit of time on is, you know, when we can see a conversation or see a relationship differently, then we're able to make a different choice in how we show up. So in, the first is just even aware, like that awareness of, oh, I'm feeding an elephant or I'm avoiding something right now. And then to get curious about that, we we find that in a lot of cases, and, and again, our you know we always say that <laughs> there's no one size fits all to um, when it comes to cu- humans communicating because every situation is different and every need is different. But largely what we found is that when we can approach a conversation, again, whether it's with ourselves or with someone else from a place of genuine curiosity, um, it can open up a lot of possibilities because if we're being curious, that means we we know that there's things we don't know. We don't know about ourselves, about the other person, about the situation. So depending, you know, when you say like, how do you start it? Like, well, it depends. Depends on what the situation is. Depends on what we're talking about. But um, if we're talking, for example, let's be really specific. Let's say we're on a team. And, you know, and, and, and I start to become aware of, oh, I think we're dancing around something and we're, you know, this fly is buzzing around this little tiny elephant with wings is buzzing around, you know, one, one, one approach can be to make an observation of saying, Hey, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but I feel like we're avoiding talking about X. What, what do you think? And sometimes making that observation and then opening it up as a, um, an invitation for other people can be a way to to lower the heat, to be talking about the hard stuff. Um, our our approach that we lay out in the book is, oh yeah, you got it? Okay. No, I have a Stop. question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, be- because what you're saying, yeah, that's the correct approach. Uh, but uh, what I often see, especially when, it, when there's a team of different seniorities, so somebody is the leader or even a senior leader and, and so on. Um, so some people come across as very warm and and mm-hmm. you know you just have that feeling you can open up you can talk they, they, they just with their presence they create that safe environment and everybody knows oh i can speak up i can mm-hmm. share whatever i won't be judged i will be listened to and so on but it's not that many of them that possess this maybe natural ability to to really be um to really create the safe space um, and, and so very often we come across leaders um, who don't exude that um, on, on, on the first glance. Sure. And, and, and then even, and, and I know because they, they talk to me, they say, I really want people to tell me, but the way they are, you know, communicating it or, or exuding that energy on the outside, um, people feel that they are not in the safe environment. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there's, way more of those than the ones who really just normally exude warmth. So maybe if if we could tackle it from that perspective, like how do you really create that space? How do you um, exude that energy that people can really speak up, that they will not be judged, that they will be heard, uh, that they can, it's a safe space. I I think that's really interesting. And I would love to hear your take on that. Well, a couple of things are coming up for me as you were talking. One is that, um, you know, uh, warmth and curiosity aren't connected. W- warmth is that energy, that feeling like you were describing that, that energy that right away people go, oh, okay, they're, they feel caring or they, f- it feels like they're, they're, uh, May, they may be open for me to have this conversation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that person is truly open. <laughs> it might, might just be the foot in the door. It might give me the impression. But I think that I think that what's possible is that you can be somebody who's not that high warmth and and still create a culture of safety. Uh, and, and a couple of ways we do that is one through the language we use, through the questions we ask. And, 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 and this is what can get really tricky. And I see this in some of my clients is 
and how we receive it when people do bring it up. So it's not uncommon that I'll, and I'll observe it where somebody goes, oh no, people can totally have hard conversations with me. And the moment somebody disagrees with them, they shut it down. Or the moment somebody disagrees with them, they get really defensive instead of creating a space of, huh, that's a different perspective than mine. Let's have this conversation. And so one of the things we have to be aware of is in creating a couple of things, in creating a safe environment, you, one, you don't get to decide if it's safe. I do, right? As a person who's stepping into it. But two, to be really impeccable with how you receive it when somebody brings somebody difficult to you. I mean, I'm a firm believer that when we're asking for feedback, what we're really doing is showing the other person that we can be trusted with information that might be difficult to hear. Um, but more specific strategies can be, um, you know, asking a team, say in a meeting, what what hasn't been said? What is something that uh, that hasn't been said that would be important for us to talk about? Um, a way to engage people into perhaps um, bringing up disagreements or different perspectives could be asking a question like, um, uh, what's a, what's a, what do I want to say? What's a watch out uh, related to this project that we haven't, that you think we haven't considered yet, that would be important for us to explore. So thinking about what questions can we use to invite people, that's more than just, oh, I, I'm a, I've got an open door, you can say whatever, <laughs> because the other thing that's true is if I'm the leader, if you're the leader, Miha, and you have power and authority over me, that that inherently makes it riskier for me to speak up and speak out against you. Well, I mean, you started really well with giving some examples and and i love examples real life examples so you know just uh you can ask this you can say this so if you can just you know elaborate a little bit yeah. more give some more real life examples i think that can help so many people yeah i i think that uh i mean so a couple of things you know that you can try is again making those observation statements i find especially when it's on a team but if we're talking one on one um, a couple of things we can do is, you know, so we, we talk about the curiosity first approach, which is get curious with yourself, get curious about the other person and then get curious with them. And the reason, the reason that we start from a place of curiosity, again, not in every situation, but often is because when, when we're struggling, what we've observed is that often we don't see people take the time to understand why they're frustrated. They just know they're frustrated. So they don't get they don't get clear around if it's a relationship issue, what value of mine is being stepped on or not honored? What um, needs do I have that aren't being met? So when we think about questions we can ask ourselves, those are some questions. What am I feeling right now? What needs do I have that aren't being met? What uh, what values do I have that's not being honored? What is this a preference or a performance issue? Um, and then a question that I love to invite people to ask is, what role did I play in this situation? And and that doesn't have to take a lot of time to ask, and you don't have to ask all of those questions. But sometimes what we see is that when people get frustrated, they don't take time to get uh, to really understand what's causing the frustration, to then have a conversation about that. They often don't have, they don't consider the other person's perspective because I'm triggered, right? And it's just biological that I'm going to be thinking about my my needs in this moment. And then, and then getting curious about someone is about, it's not about um, making assumptions about how they're feeling. It's just reminding ourselves that they have a perspective that might be different than ours. And and, and depending on, on what kind of conversation we need to have, I always like to think of it like this. How do I prime for the conversation? How do I prepare when, when I have that opportunity? Um, you know, for example, the questions I ask myself and I ask clients is, what's the impact that you want to try to make on this conversation? And based off of that, who do you need to be and what do you need to do or not do in order to try to increase the likelihood of that impact? And then, um, then to invite the conversation. I think sometimes, so often when things, we might be struggling with something, and I'd be curious to hear your perspective, is that we can approach it like a confrontation instead of just a conversation. No, yeah, I, I agree. Um, so very often things are dealt with in the moment. And then mm. when you throw a bomb uh, on the table, people just tend to... Uh, defend themselves and mm -hmm. uh, so just preparing 
for a harder conversation uh, can, can mean a whole lot. And then another thing that I see is that very often those conversations, if they do happen, they stay tend to stay on the surface mm. without peeling mm. the onion yeah. and, and going deeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on, bo- on both parties' side, and and that and that's actually where we start to understand. Well, what's what's what what is really my issue? You know, I I think about I think about a situation I went in, and I was struggling with a team member, uh, like a, a colleague, a colleague of mine, and I was struggling with how she was communicating to me, and I I just knew that I I didn't feel good after every conversation, but I paused and I went, gosh, what is it about? the way we interact that makes me feel this way. And I realized for me in the moment, it was because I felt I was being talked at and, and, and you know, that I, the value of mine that was being stepped on was curiosity, right? There wasn't a willingness to hear why did we make the decisions we did? It was just, you're wrong. You need to do it this way. And it was, well, there was a whole reason why we made this decision and we're not even having a conversation or dialogue. I felt lectured at. And so that, opened up me getting clear about that made me realize, oh, I need, I needed something different from this relationship or this, these conversations. And it was going below the surface to understand it. So instead of me just staying upset at her, (laughs) I was able to understand, Hey, this is, this is where I'm struggling actually. And then when we finally got into the conversation, then I learned about why she was struggling that actually had nothing to do with me, but was with the situation. And so in the, in the, in the process of being willing to get curious about her and what she needed, I realized, oh, this, I, I, I'm just kind of the messenger that's getting, <laughs> getting the anger directed. And then we were able to have a much different conversation, but it, that, I mean, that peeling back. And I think that we, you know, sometimes at work, we, we try to, or it's easy to keep things really transactionally. And we forget that we're humans with needs and humans with hearts and values that can be hurt. And, um, and it's important to, to understand that. Yeah, and especially we live in a, such a fast paced world mm-hmm. where uh, there's just so many tasks and everything. And we just don't have that uh, very often. We don't take that time to really think things through and and to go deeper with ourselves, to go deeper with our colleagues, with our leaders and so on. And then there's another thing that I very often see is um, no feedback Mm. afterwards. So, you know, Mm. let's say you're you're my leader, I have an idea, I come to you, I, I present you the idea or whatever it is, and then not getting any feedback two, three days later, even if it's like, you know, like, Hey, Miha, this was a good idea. It's not within our budget or we already tried it or Mm. I don't know, it it, it doesn't go with our brand message or whatever it is. But just that feeling that we really were hurt Mm. and somebody took a few minutes to think about it and give us feedback. And I think that, 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 that loop that needs to be ended with feedback, then what happens is next time when I have an idea, I'm like, well, you know, nobody listens to me anyway. Right. Um, and I just don't share it. Right, right. And that that certainly wasn't the manager's intention, but that was the impact. And that, I mean, that happens so often or, or maybe sometimes even, I don't know if it's worse. Sometimes it can feel worse. It's just, no, we're not doing it with no explanation. I mean, we hear that from a lot of people like, just tell me why it's, you don't need to implement it. And I think about, uh, I've always thought I've always thought of humans through the basic lens of we want to be seen, we want to be heard, and we want to know we add value. And uh, Tara J. Or Tara J. Frank, she recently just published a book called The Waymakers that I I absolutely um, adore. And and the way she articulates it is that people want to be seen for who they are. They want to be uh, valued. They want to be respected and they want to be protected. And part of that, what you're talking about is that respect of you value me enough and you're giving me the respect to close that loop. The thing I, the thing is when we talk about creating cultures of safety is that, yes, there are, there are places we've probably worked with them. We've worked for them. Hopefully we haven't created them, but you know, we're humans. And, but that, that the behavior of leaders or the environment is so toxic that, there are, th- those cultures do exist, but I find that the vast majority are just, there's this real gap between what people intend to do and the actual impact that they make. Well, Sarah, let me ask you like this then. 
So, you know, for the last two years, we had mm -hmm. the whole virus thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a majority of companies, they went to remote work, mm -hmm. uh, which leads to even less human-to-human -human interactions, the, um, you know, coffee together or chat around the water cooler or whatever it was. Um, and what's your experience uh, how did those relationships and uh, tackling the elephants or even eliminating the elephant uh -huh. before it becomes, um, how, how do you see that in, in, in this new world that we are experiencing yeah. in, in, the, in the work space? And you, and you hit it on the head that there's not as many um, happenstance human to human moments, right? There's not as many chance moments where we're seeing each other. So some of the things that we're observing is that it's really easy for companies to become very transactional in their communication and to be very task focused when they are connecting um, as a team or as a group. And so we have to be even more intentional about building those human to human moments. You know, I think about just today, we were on a on a team call and one of our colleagues, she's just, she's struggling. She's, you know, she's got a lot on her plate. She's managing a lot. And, you know, and we just gave her the space that she needed to be able to share. And I think that, I think one of the risks in the watch out that we're seeing is that we get so focused on the task that we forget to take time to really build our togetherness. So that's one thing we're seeing. That's, I mean, some companies are doing it really, really well and others are, are struggling. When it comes to navigating the, the, um, elephant in the room. In some cases, there are some, we, you know, we've heard this, we've seen this, we've observed it, that there are some things that um, have become less important, or there's less opportunities to have the meetings after the meetings. So the elephant, some elephants don't come into the room as, as strongly, intensely. There's other people who, you know, truthfully, because of maybe who they are and the environment they work in, they feel safer working from home. And so they're not experiencing the same kind of perhaps harm or aggression that they would have. And so, um, so it, in that case, it's removed some of the elephants, right? That have that have come up. But it's a real. Um, I wish I I need to go back and find it. But I I was reading something recently that talked about in having you know tough conversations this person's research was showing it's actually better to do it by phone and i and i wasn't sure about that i needed to look into the validity of all of that instead of video but it it is possible to build those strong relationships it is possible to have those conversations where we say hey wait time out ouch uh, can we talk about that it just requires much more intentionality than I think that many people were used to pre-pandemic. Well, Sarah, um, yeah, sometimes I guess from all the to-dos, all the tasks, all the expectations and KPIs and, yeah. and, and all of that hoopla, we just forget to be human beings. Yeah. Uh, or not forget, but we, we just don't have the time or we don't allow ourselves to take the time to... Uh, take a step back and, and, and do a little bit of thinking. So I'm wondering, do you have maybe, um, you know, a process or, or, or you know, uh, three steps to building a new habit or, you know, something, something that people can take away from here and, and implement in their daily lives so that they can get back into the habit of being a human being? Yeah, I, you know, one one of the I mean it's it's simple not easy that the one of the formulas I love when thinking about trying to build new behavior habits and I I don't know who created this but I first read about it in the the book the coaching habit by Michael Bung, uh, Bungay Stainer and it's it's when this happens so when when this situation happens instead of doing this I'm going to do this and so it might be when I get on with the team, instead of just jumping into the task, I'm going to ask everyone, how was your weekend, right? So think about replacing a behavior. And the other thing I would say specific to, to building relationship is a really simple thing is to schedule regular meetings, whatever that cadence is for you and for your industry and, and the team that you serve, where you can just connect on a personal level. Now, what I will say, 
and part of what has stretched some people is that there's a lot of people, especially uh, certain people who are in positions of power and authority, who struggled with building those empathetic, you know, personal relationships, human to human relationships before. And so adding, adding the, um, adding the space of us not being together has been really challenging for some, but even for people who are really good at it, who are naturally warm, who right are thinking about people that there is an intentionality. So, so think about just, even if it's once a week or once every, every couple weeks of just checking in with people on a human to human level, um, or, you know, after we know something, let's say, Hey, looking at, uh, what, what we're experiencing, right. We've, had a lot of uh, violent uh, tragedy happen in the U.S. right now, and just checking in, going, "Here's how I'm feeling about it. How's everyone else doing?" And just creating that space. It's just, it's, it's, you know, so often when people talk about it's harder to build relationships virtually. I hear that because it it requires us to build it differently. But I would argue that we weren't always great at it before. We just had more opportunities. Like you said, we have more opportunities at the break room. So we just have to be much more intentional. Yeah. Things just happen naturally. And now, mm -hmm. now it's much, you have to be really much more intentional. Well, Sarah, I mean, whenever I talk to you, time just flies. And, and Oh yeah, we're at already we at time. Yeah. We are already close to that. So I still have two questions for you. So the first question is, um, did I forgot to ask you something and, you know, like that last golden nugget of wisdom uh, that you might want to share with the audience where you really feel it's important for them to hear it. So, um, you know, this is like the open space. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> the floor is mine. I, uh, I think that I, I will go back to what I said, that the comfort we gain in the short term almost never outweighs the damage in the long term. We are far more resilient. We have far more self-efficacy uh, to have the conversations than sometimes we imagine. And, 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 and yes, it's a risk. It's always a risk when something matters and is, is important to us, but with practice, it will, it will become easier. Might not ever be easy, but it will become easier. I like I, I love how you say it. I'll have to go back and 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 make a note uh, from this interview because what I like to always say to our clients is uh, easy doesn't equal freedom. Yes, I love but I, I love your way way more than 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 mine. It's <laughs> it's it's more easy to understand and and we explains it way better so yeah I have to get uh, yeah to that. we always say it's just practice makes it easier but it might not be easy like that's yeah. what, i mean what, I, okay here's actually one quick thing here's one last thing if i may is that sure. so often when we talk about having difficult conversations one of the big things we hear from people is that um basically this desire to not have it be difficult I, I want to be more confident. And then when I say, well, what would it look like to be confident in having the conversation? Well, I wouldn't be nervous and my heart wouldn't race and I wouldn't be scared about the consequences. And I go, well, that's just, that's actually just part of it. So our goal isn't to remove the discomfort. The goal is how do we be, be present with it, but not paralyzed by it? Because if I care about you, if, if you, and I do, and if something happened in our relationship and I needed to tell, tell you something that maybe you said or did that was you know, harmful or, um, or, or even that would be hard for you to hear, that's going to be difficult because I care about you or maybe I care about the outcome. And so there's, there's a risk. This is why, hell, this is why we avoid it is because we're protecting ourselves. And so, so, so that idea of if you're, if you're striving for the goal, that it'll be comfortable, that it won't be difficult. Um, I think you're chasing after something that may not exist, but, but you can, right. We can learn to be present with the discomfort. We can learn how to not be paralyzed by it. We can learn strategies for how we can show up and be more courageous and compassionate. Um, that could hopefully again, make it easier, but maybe not make it easy. And, you know, maybe just learn how to become more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Exactly. hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, Sarah, my last question. Uh, so I know that whoever will watch this will absolutely love you because that's how 
uh, you are as a person. You're a very lovable person and you really know what you talk about. So what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Is it to, you know, go get the book or reach out to you on LinkedIn, website? Like what's the best way and who should reach out to you? Yeah. So all of the above, if you know, if you are, if you are somebody who you're hearing this going, I, when I describe the book, I say it's my love letter to my fellow avoiders of conflict. So if that describes you, go to any place where books are sold and you can check it out. It's Don't Feed the Elephants, Overcoming the Art of Avoidance to Build Powerful Partnerships. But if you're interested in connecting just to learn more or even to have a place to say, hey, I'm struggling with this, you can go to our website, sarahnollwilson.com. Also on social media, on LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm very active on both of those and my DMs are always open. So I always welcome a conversation. Perfect. Well, Sarah. Miha, wait. Are you gonna? I mean, can I ask you? A, I mean, this is. This sure, is it. you can ask me anything. I mean, you don't have to answer it, but how? What? What do you want to sell it? What do you want to hold on to? Because I asked before we started. You know, I said, "What was your intention for your last show today?" And you said, "Me," because it's always been about the guest. What? What do you want to hold on to from all of these conversations you've done? over the last three and a half years? It, it, it was just an amazing journey. Uh, I, I've met people I would never meet otherwise. I, I've had guests from all over the world, from, from New Zealand to US and everything in between. And it was just an amazing journey. And, and so many uh, great relationships were created. Um, most of those guests, uh, it wasn't just like a one-time thing. Oh, let's do the interview and that's it. With with a whole bunch of them, we stayed connected. We we often do some catch-up calls and, and and stuff like that. And uh, the quality of my life and 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 the happiness of my life have really grown through this experience. And um and in in the near future, hopefully, with this whole Corona thing, I don't know what will happen in autumn, but I'm actually planning to come to US, mm. Canada for two to three months to really hop from city to city to, uh, and and I just know that I can, uh, is thank, uh, thanks to this uh, LinkedIn Live, uh, I can call so many people and say, hey, you know, I'm coming to this city or that city. Um, you want to meet up? You, you want to hang out? And I know they will say yes. And, and just an amazing feeling. And, and it, I'm so grateful to the opportunity that was provided to me by LinkedIn to be one of the first 100 LinkedIn Live uh, uh, guys. I still don't know why they gave me that. Uh, <laughs> it just happened one morning. The mail was in my <laughs> inbox and I first thought it was a scam. Sure. Um, <laughs> and somebody just wants my credit card. Uh, but yeah, it, it was just an amazing journey. Uh, and I'm really, really grateful for it. And then We'll see what happens next. Yeah. Congratulations. I, you know, I mean, we know with any, you know, podcast, they usually only last six to eight episodes. And I don't know what that is for live streaming, but live streaming is a whole different commitment because you have to be there. There's no. And so I just, I want to take a moment as somebody who's been fortunate to be on the show a few times in the space that you create and just to, just again, to celebrate and congratulate you on three and a half years of having weekly conversations. Not everyone can say that they've done that or had the impact that you had. So thank well, you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. But yeah, um, this is it. Um, time for us to say goodbye. It's almost a little bit hard because yeah, mm -hmm. but we, we can manage that. So I, I'm really, really so grateful that uh, through Sharon, we were introduced. Sharon introduced me to many amazing people and you are really one of the most amazing of all of them uh so thank you so much for being my guest not just once but a few times and uh just i appreciate you for what you do and who you are and 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 everything about you so thank you so much and uh, i definitely look forward to staying in touch with you and doing some catch-up calls every now and then, and then who For knows? Sure. Maybe well, we'll have seeing, you on my you, show. seeing you, seeing you in person when I yeah, come to visit the U.S. I mean, it's Iowa, so usually it's not 
it's not the hot spot people are going to, but you know, if it's close, <laughs> it's close enough within driving distance, I'll come, I'll come find you. <laughs> okay. Or we might be in a city at the same time. That would be. That Who would knows? Be Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, Sarah, thank you so much uh, you, for everything you've shared for, uh, everything about you who you are and what you do and um, i absolutely wish you everything the best on the journey that uh you are you are following feelings mutual my friend take care sarah bye bye okay everybody so yeah as you heard last episode uh, it's been it's been a journey. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna say I'll see you next Monday uh, because I won't. Uh, but you know, I'll think of something. But until then, uh, make sure that you connect with Sarah. She is truly an amazing, wonderful, and warm person, and she really knows her stuff. And I know that uh, she can be of great uh, help and assistance to you if you're struggling through avoiding the elephants in the room um so yeah um i wish everybody um that you are all healthy and safe through all the shenanigans that are happening around the world and uh yeah i'll see you at some next time with something new uh when the time comes take care everybody have a lovely day and week <laughs>